From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith in Lives of a Bengal Lancer. Lux presents Hollywood. This is the thrilling story of the men who bring peace and order to a far-flung corner of India. Suggested by the book by Francis Yates Brown and filmed by Paramount, we stage Lives of a Bengal Lancer with Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, C. Aubrey Smith, Jackie Cooper, and Douglas Dumbro. Between the acts, you'll hear General Hugh S. Johnson, former NRA administrator and now celebrated columnist of the Scripps Howard newspapers. The music of the Lux Radio Theater is conducted by Louis Silvers. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those gentle, fast-dissolving flakes millions of women use every day. It's easy to see why Lux is so popular. Just pour lukewarm water on a few of these featherlight flakes. You'll see them fluff up instantly into glorious suds. These rich, buoyant suds float out every trace of soil and perspiration and leave your things fresh and sweet and lovely looking too because Lux is kind to colors and fabrics. These gentle Lux flakes keep your things new looking longer. They're the safe, thrifty care for stockings, under things, dresses, blouses, and sweaters. Yes, for everything safe in water. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The region of the Kaiba Pass in the desolate mountains of northwest India is a land where time stands still. There at this moment, on mounted patrol, are some of the most extraordinary and superb cavalry the world has ever seen, the Bengal Lancers. Commanded by British officers, you'll find in their ranks native Mohammedans, Hindus, and powerful, dignified Sikhs who wear their full black beards held close to their faces in nets, rattle iron bracelets at their wrists, and stick tiny daggers in their turbaned hair. On one side of their saddles hangs a sword, on the other a rifle, while their fingers embrace the primitive but deadly bamboo lance, whose steel head has bred respect for peace and the Union Jack in the haunts of the ferocious Afridi tribesmen. This story is told tonight by four vigorous commentators, Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, C. Aubrey Smith, and Jackie Cooper. With a background as adventurous as anything in fiction, Errol rides tonight as Lieutenant McGregor, of the Bengal Lancers. Brian Ahern, pilot and aviation enthusiast, is seen shortly in the much-talked-of Hal Roach production, Captain Fury. We hear him as Lieutenant Forsyth. Back in 1888, in the gold fields of South Africa, C. Aubrey Smith was pronounced dead of pneumonia. However, he, he had other ideas on the subject. And now, in his 76th year, is a player with the Hollywood Cricket Club and its president. Commander of the Order of the British Empire. This great character actor is with us tonight as Colonel Stone. And Jackie Cooper, who's been an actor for 11 of his 16 years, is Hollywood's most popular and persistent trap drummer. He comes here from the set of Paramount's What a Life and is heard as Lieutenant Stone. Douglas Dumbrill returns to us as Mohammed Khan. And so we set our sights for India as the Lux Radio Theater presents Lives of a Bengal Lancer. India, the India of the northwest frontier. Looming like frowning barriers are the mountains, rugged cliffs ideal for sniping, from which the bloodthirsty hill tribes swoop down eager for battle against a handful of seasoned British soldiers. Here is stationed His Majesty's crack Indian regiment, the 41st Bengal Lancers. On an almost impassable roadway, a small detachment of Lancers struggles upward into the hills. There's no sign of life above them. No movement on the cliffs. But suddenly... Column, halt! Well, there you are, Hendrickson. I told you they're up there. I never doubted it, Mr. McGregor. Well, what do we do? Just stand here and take it? We go forward slowly. But on no account do we return fire. But they're Colonel shooting Stone's at us, orders. man. What did he send us out here for? I don't know, McGregor, and neither do you, but the Colonel does. Forward! 
Hendrickson, this is suicide. I don't mind getting pink, but I want at least one shot at the beggars. Where I come from... Where you come from, the Royal Canadian Mounted always get their man. But you're not in Canada now, Mr. McGregor. There. That's Lawton. He's down. Now we can start something. No, I tell you. Colonel's orders. Hold your fire. But the old fool can't have foreseen this, Hendrickson. Look, Mac, I'd like to have you with me in war, but for peace, you're... 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 too. <gasps> Hendrickson. Call him, Walt. Hendrickson. Where is it? I- Im- impulsive. That, that's what I was trying to say. Mr. McGregor, is Captain Hendrickson hurt, sir? He's dead. Open fire. Break every tree and rock on that cliff. Go on. <laughs> I don't understand it. I gave definite orders to Hendrickson that our detachment was not to return fire. Perhaps there's some explanation, Colonel Stone. All we know, at least till they get back, is that there was a skirmish and we drove the Afridis back into the hills. Skirmish, yes. With Mohammed Khan himself. Mohammed Khan? Certainly. He was nibbling at my bait, too. If he'd come down off that hill, I'd have had him at last. Four detachments were standing by in the rear to surround him. So that was your plan? Of course. Now I can't prove it was Mohammed Khan. I don't touch him. I'm shocked at Hendrickson. I thought him a good officer. Perhaps, sir, if you'd explain to the detachment that they were only there as bait. Explain orders? Explain orders to subordinates? I'm surprised at you, Hamilton. What is it? Mr. McGregor, sir. McGregor? He was second in command, sir. Send him in. Mr. McGregor? Well, McGregor, why didn't Hendrickson come himself? Wounded? No, sir. Dead, sir. Dead? Killed by the Afridis, sir. There's your explanation, Colonel. Most unfortunate. Most unfortunate, the command was handed down to you, McGregor. You didn't know my orders. I knew them, sir. You did? And you deliberately disobeyed them? Why? We were losing men, sir. But you did disobey my orders? Yes, sir. And when Hendrickson was killed, I... Hendrickson knew my orders and obeyed them. Hendrickson was a good soldier. It is more than I can say for you. You will go to your quarters, Mr. McGregor. I say, easy on the bungalow, Mac. You're looking very sour, Mr. McGregor. Would you mind turning the other way? You disturb my music. You know, I'm finally getting the hang of this Afghan clarinet. Listen. Oh, will you please lay off that thing, Forsyth? Oh, certainly, Mr. McGregor. Oh. What's the matter, Mac? Been reprimanded? Yes. Oh, Ramrod Stone. I'm no soldier, apparently, because when I'm attacked, I fight back. Ah, I was afraid you'd get in trouble over that patrol business. Why, you knew Hendrickson had strict orders not to fire. I was speaking to Mr. Dawson, Forsyth. I beg your pardon, old man. The colonel's been on this border 20 years, Mick. He knows it pretty well. And I don't, I suppose. Well, I know enough to fight back when my men begin to fall. Stone's got nothing but a ramrod for a backbone. Oh, yes, I know he's a terror for drilling. But when it comes to the real thing, what's he got? Nothing. Bravo! Hurrah for Mr. McGregor! Why, Mr. McGregor? Yes, and here comes the other boot. And here, here are the day's orders all type, Colonel. Thank you, Major. Routine, routine. Uh, What's this, Major? Uh, the, uh, the the subaltern replacement for Hendrickson. He arrives tomorrow on the Delhi train. Oh. What are they sending us? Uh, Stone, sir, from Sandhurst. From Sandhurst? Yes, sir. Straight to the frontier from military college? Well, he can't even be dry behind the ears. What did you say his name is? Uh, Stone, sir. Donald Stone. I see. Huh. You have a brother in the war office, haven't you, Hamilton? Yes, sir. And who asked you and him to interfere in my personal affairs? pair of you, maiden aunts, wangling my son into a cushy berth so his father will make things short for him, eh? Will you forget you're my colonel for a moment, sir? Why not? Huh. You've forgotten it. Look, Tom, in two years you'll have to retire. Oh, you feel sorry for me, is that it? Not at all. It's only to keep the name of Stone in the 41st after you've gone. Keep the name in the 41st. Sentimentality. You don't know what you've done, Hamilton. He, he belongs to his mother, not to me. She took him away from me. Hated the army, everything about it. I haven't seen him since he was a little shaver. But the only decent thing she ever did was to put him through Sandhurst. And now you do this. I've a good mind to refuse him. Hardly fair, Tom, to ship him back without trial. Well, you'll have to measure up to my standards. 
And at the first sign of favoritism from you or anyone else, there'll be trouble. That's an order, Major Hamilton. Lieutenant McGregor? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Forsyth? Yes, Major. Meet the replacement subaltern at the Delhi train. He'll be quartered in the bungalow with you. Lieutenant Donald Stone is the name. Stone? The Colonel's son. His what? He said his son. Well, well. Imagine old Ramrod having been that human. Oh, I never even knew he was married. Why, sure. Can't you see him proposing? Madam, you'll marry me Wednesday the 29th. Be at the church at 10. That's an order. <laughs> Furthermore, you're improperly dressed, madam. <laughs> Boom. Well, this is the living room. The washroom opens off here, Mr. Stone. Why, I thought you'd be living in shacks. This is positively luxurious. No, oh, we, uh, we tried to be civilized, Mr. Stone. Uh, wait till that heat comes down now. Well, let's have a look at the stables, eh? It's all rather thrilling, don't you think? Thrilling? Oh, I mean, it's like Kipling and all that. Kipling? Kipling? Well, who's Kipling, Mr. Forsyth? Kipling? Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I don't believe I ever heard of him. Oh, really? Oh, well, you're, you're pulling my leg, of course. Gentlemen... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. It's always been my impression that we salute when passing a superior officer. Sorry, sir, we didn't see you. Who's this? A new subaltern replacement, sir. Colonel Stone, um, Lieutenant Stone. Uh, how do you do, sir? Ah, yes, yes. Mr. Stone, you've come to us direct from military training school, hmm? Without previous service? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, you've a great deal to learn. I trust you'll measure up to our requirements. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Good afternoon sir. Good afternoon. Doesn't he, doesn't he ever say more than that to newcomers? Oh, yes. Sometimes he comments on the weather. Oh. You see, the colonel's pretty much of a stickler for red tape. I mean, the distance between his men and all that, you know. Oh. Well, well, then, I, I'm no exception. I mean, he didn't single me out for anything? No, no, that's just his manner. He's all right when you know him. Oh. You must excuse me, you know. Well, this is the first time I can ever remember ever seeing him. What? Do you mean it? I... I don't know quite what I expected. Well, you'll know next time. Oh, look, wait. I nearly forgot something. Now, where did I put that? Oh, here. Uh, take this paper to the colonel. We're just done. Regimental headquarters. Well, did he ask to have me take this to him? I said take it to the colonel. I forgot to give it to him. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. <laughs> nice work, Mr. McGregor. Well, what's funny about that? <laughs> you are. <laughs> Rough soldier. Heart of gold. Reconciling father and son after years of separation. Oh, he's all right when you know him. Uh, <laughs> Since when? That paper was a blank, wasn't it? Oh, why don't you shut up? Oh, never mind, Mac. The mother instinct comes out in all of us. <laughs> I kiss the dear fingers so uh. toil worn for me. So bless you and keep you, dear mother McGregor. Oh, get out. Come in. Lieutenant Stone, sir. Oh. oh. Well, Lieutenant? For this paper, sir, I, I was told to bring it to you. Well, let's have it. Of, of all the... Where did you get this? Mr. McGregor, sir. He said... Infernal oh. impudence. I beg your pardon, sir. No, 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 no. Not you, not you, not you. Well, how's your mother? Quite well, sir. Good, good. She always hated the army, didn't she? Yes, sir. I don't understand how she let you go through Sandhurst. She had to, sir. I kept after her. Oh. You wanted to be a soldier, eh? We've always been soldiers for generations. Still, you're not one yet, you know. Yes, sir. You shouldn't be here on the frontier. But I am, sir. Yes, and why? Influence, favoritism. But with me, the good of the service, the regiment, comes first. That's what Mother always said about you, sir. Yes, that's what your mother always said. Well, well, now you're here, don't try to take advantage. I won't, sir. I didn't expect... And you understand, of course, the situation makes any sort of social relationship impossible. Yes, sir. Is that all, sir? That's all, Lieutenant. What's that? That? Well, that's the Mohammedan call to prayer. You always know when it's time to dress for dinner by that. Hand me that shaving mug, will you, Stan? No. 
See the colonel today? Yes. Huh, so did I. I got another reprimand for sending in blank orders. I imagine you didn't do so well either. I'm sorry, Stan. Quite all right. What'd you do all day? Stable duty. What? So soon? I'm not complaining. Well, that wouldn't help you anyhow. You know, every time I look in this mirror, I remind myself of my old man. Ooh, back home. Where was that? Alberta, Canada, wheat farm. You know, I had a coat once. A lot of nerves. A lot of class, too. You can see when he was a yearling, he was no cart horse. Well, my old man hooked him to a plow. And he took all the spirit out of him. He said he'd break him in, and he did. You don't have to be so subtle, Mac. Huh? Am I the horse? What do you mean? I'm no two-year-old, Mr. McGregor, and if anybody thinks my old man is going to break my nerve, he's mistaken. Well, I wasn't thinking of you at all. Hey, Forsyth, lay off that thing, will you? And hey, let me tell you another thing. I don't need a nurse, Mr. McGregor. What on earth are you talking about? I... Forsyth, do you have to do that? Well, it's the softer side to my nature, like yours. Uh, Stone, get out there and tell him to stop that thing, will you? Tell him it's an order. Yes, sir. Mother McCree, I'd like to wrap that thing around his neck. McGregor! McGregor! What's the matter? Forsyth, he's on the veranda. There's a cobra right above him, swaying to the music. Where's a revolver? Oh, wait a minute. A cobra? Yes, right over his head. Well, never mind, I'll take care of it. He'll be all right as long as he keeps playing. Come on. Oh, Mr. Forsyth. Very pretty. You're improving. They're lovely little things, cobras. Especially when they're swaying three inches from your nose. Shoot it. Quick. Oh, no, no. How about a few variations for the right hand? Cobras have a softer side of their natures, too, haven't they? Finds an outlet in music. Of course, as soon as you stop playing... Well, I've heard of men living two and three hours afterwards. Knew one fellow who lived two days. What's the matter? Getting tired? Oh, come on. Two or three more notes, Forsyth. Come on, that's right. Now, if you move your own nose a half inch to the left... All right, steady. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. Well, you win, mister. Here, for sale, cheap. One second-hand Afghan bagpipe. Mother McCree. Sent for me, sir? Yes. Take a seat. Mr. McGregor, I assume you're familiar with the roads northeast of Fort Jamrod? Yes, sir. Then listen closely. We suspect there's a coalition of several of the border states being formed against us. We think the ringleader is Mohammed Khan, chief of the Magala. I have a spy in his territory, a Ghazi horse dealer. He's now at Jadput Pass, waiting to get a message through to me. I want you to get in touch with him, and you'll leave at once. Yes, sir. Take one subaltern and ten men. Yes, sir. What subaltern shall I take, sir? Any preferences? Oh, Mr. Stone, sir. No. No service experience. Take Forsyth. But Lieutenant Stone hasn't seen any duty yet, sir. If he's ever going to get any experience... Did you he... hear what I said, Mr. McGregor? You'll take Forsyth, not Stone. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Here are your orders. And this time, please obey them. I will, sir. All ready, Mr. McGregor, Mr. Forsyth? Yes, all right. already. Why wasn't I sent on this exposition? You've got to tell me. Ready, sir? In a moment. Wait a minute. Why don't you answer me? Now, look here, Stone. I'd have taken you along, but you haven't had any experience. What excuse is that? How am I ever going to have experience? I'm doing things here that I learned my first year in Sandhurst. Stable duty. I haven't asked any favors. I'm not asking now. But I resent being held back because I happen to be related to the commanding officer. No one's holding you back. He is. And you let him choose Forsyth. He didn't choose. I chose. I chose Forsyth. Very well. Very well. It looks as if I ever want to get any experience. I'll have to get it myself. What? Now, what was all that about? Oh, well, whatever it is, we haven't time for it now. Mother McCree, that's me, all right. Biggest fool in the lances. Hm. Forward! Curtain Falls on Act One of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. During this brief intermission, we bring you that lovable family, the Brownings. It's after dinner, and we find the family in the living room. Mother Browning is reading, and the two girls, Dot and Midge, are chattering over their homework. What's your score now, Dot? Eighteen. What's yours, Midge? Oh, gee, mine's only nine. You've beaten me all hollow. What are you girls talking about? 
It doesn't sound like homework to me. It's our stocking scores, Mother. Your what? Stocking scores. You see, we're trying to make Midge remember to use Lux Flakes for her stocking. So oh. we've made up a little game. Yes, we're supposed to Lux our stockings every night. Only I still forget sometimes. And then we keep track of how many days our stockings wear without getting run. And, Mother, Dot's worn one pair of stockings 18 days. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it certainly is. What's your record, Midge? Well, I'd have been all right, only I went and rubbed my stockings with a cake of soap a few times and... And they popped into runs. What could you expect? Scrubbing your stockings like that, Midget. Well, anyway, I'm better than I used to be. You just wait. One of these days, my score will be as good as yours. Well, if you ever remember to always use Lux, it will be. Those girls have the right idea. Try Lux Flakes for your stockings. You'll be delighted at the way it helps your stockings wear longer. Lux saves the elasticity of silk. It stretch and give. Your stockings won't break into runs so easily, and they'll fit better, too. Yes, Lux helps stockings and all washables stay new looking longer. That's a good thing to remember, a thrifty thing to remember, because a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. And now I see Mr. DeMille is ready to raise the curtain on the second act of our play. We continue with Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. Several days have passed since McGregor and Forsyth left to seek information on the movements of the hill tribes. It's long after midnight, and in the lamplit regimental headquarters, Colonel Stone remains in conference with the Chief of Army Intelligence, Sir Thomas Woodley. Personally, I feel the Amir of Bhopal is only a tool in the hands of Mohammed Khan. Definitely, General. I've known the Amir of Bhopal 20 years, and I don't believe he'd join this war against us. Why... Every year or so, I take the regiment to Bhopal for the hunting. That means hunting wild pigs in this section. Why not drop in on him as usual this year? If our information is correct, Mohammed Khan will be there. <laughs> Nothing would please me more. Mr. McGregor has just returned, sir. Good. Ask him to come in. This is the man I sent to reconnoitre. McGregor? Well, McGregor? All safe? All safe, sir. Good. And you saw our man? Yes, sir. He says the Afghan chief is rounding up the border tribes against us. Mohammed Khan has agreed to furnish two million rounds of ammunition. Two million rounds? And did our man learn where Mohammed Khan hopes to get it? Yes, sir. By capturing our year's supply train, sir. Good work. Thank you, McGregor. Uh, may I speak, sir? Well? Why can't we slip out of here? Strike first. Wipe out Mohammed Khan before he attacks us. Huh. Are you suggesting I begin hostilities before consulting Army Intelligence headquarters? Army Intelligence. They're a bunch of old ladies, sir. They won't give us action. They'll send us to the Amir of Bhopal's for parade or pig sticking. An excellent suggestion. What? Sir Thomas, may I present Lieutenant McGregor? McGregor, this is Major General Sir Thomas Woodley, Chief of Army Intelligence. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. How do you do? Uh, very well, thank you. Colonel Stone, your regiment leaves a door to hunt wild pigs on the estate of the Amir of Bhopal. Do you hear that, McGregor? Yes, sir. Then let it be a lesson in diplomacy. Now get yourself a few hours sleep. We leave at five. Pig sticking. That's marvelous, that is. <laughs> oh, Mac, will you keep quiet? I was just falling asleep. Intelligence department. Action's just about to bust around here, and all we do is to go and ride over the private hunting grounds of a tin whistle prince, sticking lances into pigs. Wonderful. <laughs> Sounds rather fun. I ought to be good at that. Uh, oh, by the way, I've got some bad news for you. Your ward, young Stone. Well, what about him? What about him? <laughs> what about him indeed? What are you talking about? Well, every night since we left, he's been down in the native quarter of the town. Rolls home blotto about dawn. He does? Is he there now? Oh, he's out on the usual binge, I imagine. But we leave for Bhopal in two hours. Oh, my, my. What will stern father say if we leave without his son? You know, you really ought to do something about it, Mac. Oh, let old Ramrod do something about it. I'm going to bed. <laughs> I reasoned along similar lines. However, you might hang a lamp in the window or something. Native quarters, eh? Well, I suppose I'd better go and get him. So long, Nursey. Oh, shut up. The 
Mr. Forsyth. Mr. McGregor, you're late. Line's been waiting ten minutes for you. Sorry, sir. We... I mean, I overslept. Overslept? Report to me later. Join your squadron. One yes, moment, sir. sir. Well, Lieutenant Stone? He didn't oversleep, sir. Mr. McGregor spent the night digging me out of a native quarter and trying to get me sober. Mr. Stone, if I didn't need every officer, I'd place you under immediate arrest. Take a place. We leave for Bhopal at once. Fuss is for him. Big reception, fancy speeches. All Bopal will turn out in the morning for what? Well, I believe you said for pig sticking. Yeah, uh, shut up. If you don't mind, Mac, I rather like it here. It's like something out of Arabian Nights. I say, look, on that bench by the fountain, that girl. Oh, well, Mr. McGregor. Oh, definitely. She is beautiful, isn't she? I wonder who she is. <clears throat> that, my friend, is what I'm just going to find out. Uh, uh you? Well, I saw her first, didn't I? Now, Mac, you know you're lying. I oh, saw no, her. Oh, wait a minute. I, I, really, I you know, I saw her first. Loser, keep clear. But I say, really, gentlemen. <laughs> hey, look. Psst, look out. Here comes the colonel and that chief of the Oxford Brogue. Pull in your stomachs, gentlemen. Now, I'd like you to meet two more of my officers, Mr. McGregor and Mr. Forsyth. This gentleman is our friend and neighbor across the border from our station, Mohammed Khan. Oh, honored, Khan Saab. Khan Saab, a very great pleasure, gentlemen. And now, Khan Saab, if you'll grant me a few moments of private conversation, there are a few things I'd like to discuss. Well, I'll be at Muhammad Khan. The enemy himself. And I thought we came here for pig sticking. Mr. Forsyth, let me give you some advice. Never make fun of army intelligence. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGregor. And now, I believe we had some unfinished business. Oh, yes, yes, the little slide number on the bench. Right, heads or tails? Uh, don't bother, Mac. Look over there. <laughs> Your ward has beat us to it. Well, can you beat that? Well, well, I suppose we'll have to rescue him again, Forsyth. Just what I was thinking. Come along, old man. You can imagine how I felt when I saw you here, Miss Volenskaya. Tanya Volonskaya. Did I say it right? Oh, you have a wonderful Russian accent, Mr. Stone. Oh, there. I knew you were Russian. Oh. Hello, Casanova. Oh, hello. You were telling Miss Volonskaya about the opera? I'm sorry, Mr. Stone, but Major Hamilton wants you. Very important. Now, look here, Mac. I, I, That's I... an order, Mr. Stone. Very well. Pardon me, Miss Volonskaya. I'll be back in a moment. Mm -hmm. Too bad he had to leave, Miss Volonskaya. Did I hear it right? Uh, uh, did uh, we hear it right? Oh, yes. That is correct. Uh, no manners, this younger generation, Miss Volonskaya. Forgot the introductions. Now, uh, this is Mr. McGregor, who is strongly imbued with the protective instinct. Oh, and this is Mr. Forsyth, who is a snake charmer. Oh, won't you sit down? Well, thanks. Oh, thanks. You said something of snake charming? Did I? Oh, I much to talk about myself. Now, you take me. I'm from Canada, up in Alberta. Dirty trick, Mac, and I won't keep still. You will keep still. These walls are like paper, and your voice carries all over the place. You made me walk right into a heavy discussion between the colonel and that Mohammed Khan chap with the Oxford accent. The old man was furious. Look, uh, you two, please put out that lamp and go to sleep. I'll get even with you someday, Mac. You see if I don't. All right, then. If you want the truth, here it is. And this is the reason you've got to keep away from her. She's Mohammed Khan's. What? Yes, she came here with him. We found it out afterwards. She? I don't believe it. Oh, oh. He doesn't believe it, Forsyth. Oh, go to sleep. Do we have to be up every night saving him from women? <laughs> We've got to be up at dawn again for pig sticking. Pacing your tent will not settle your problems, Mohammed Khan. Perhaps not, Tanya. But it will help assuage my anger. Is the great Mohammed Khan angry at the unexpected? You don't understand. I laid a trap for this wise old fox of a British colonel to fall into. I wished him to attack the border while I remained peacefully here. His being here ruins my plans to seize the two million rounds of ammunition I pledged myself to furnish. You would like to have the old fox attack the border? What else have I been saying? Have you ever taken a cub? from a tigress. Is this a time for riddles? What do you mean? The wise old fox has brought with him his cub. He paid you marked attention this evening. Mm -hmm. Yes, the cub likes me. Now, if that cub were captured, 
taken wherever you want the old one to follow. <laughs> <laughs> My dear Tanya, forgive me. I'm continually surprised to discover intelligence in a woman of such great beauty. <laughs> Perhaps we have not lost yet, my Tanya. If you could send him a message secretly tonight. At once, Mohammed Khan. Who is it? Who's out there? Open the door. Hey, that sounds like Major Hamilton. Oh, of all times to wake a man up. McGregor. Forsyth. Yes, sir. We'll sir. go to the Colonel's quarters at once. Yes, sir. Anything wrong? Mohammed Khan and his men have decamped, and they've taken young Stone with them. Colonel, if he's gone back to the border, we can be at Magala as soon as he can. This regiment can ride, sir. I'm quite aware my regiment can ride, but it's not going to ride. Mohammed Khan kidnapped my son to goad me into pursuing him, to draw the lancers out of position. He's mistaken his man. The regiment stays right here, obedient to the intelligence department. Then let me go, sir. I could take a small detachment. And... Thank you, Mr. McGregor, but I'll allow no officer to risk his life when another's own disobedience and folly caused his trouble. Colonel Stern, you've been on the border a long time, I know. But perhaps you've never heard what Muhammad Khan does to his prisoners. I've been on this border 20 years, Mr. McGregor. You're unnecessarily dramatic. Am I? I was just beginning to think I was wrong about you. But I wasn't. You're nothing but a ramrod. You'll sit here while they kill your son by inches. Please, Mr. McGregor. Pending charges of insubordination, consider yourself under arrest. Mr. Forsyth? Yes, sir. You'll be responsible for the prisoner. Yes, sir. Come along, McGregor. Colonel Stone, you... That will do. Yes, sir. Major Hamilton? Yes, Colonel. You will see that everything goes on as usual. We must show no alarm. Yes, sir. It's strange, Major. But for the first time, I begin to realize I have a son. You will go to your quarters, Major. You spoke your mind, if there's any virtue in that. Regiment, duty, you're improperly dressed. The old stuffed shirt, why, I could... Ah, look here, man, get some sense. Do you imagine it was easy for him to do this? Well, why not? He'd do the same to any of us. That's where you're wrong. I watched his face. He was as white as a sheet. Well, isn't that nice? That's being a man and a soldier, I suppose. Well, if it is, I don't want any part of it. Look, Mick, did it ever occur to you to wonder why a handful of men have managed to order the lives of 300 million people out here in India? It's because he's here, and a few more like him. Men who put their jobs ahead of everything, neither death, death, nor love can move them from it. And when his breed dies out, well, that's the end, dear Mick. Huh. You're on his side, are you? Well, I'm not. He can sit over there and hug his duty all he wants to, but I'm going to do something. I'm going after that kid. Oh, really, Mr. McGregor? <laughs> you place me in a most unfortunate position. Now, listen, Forsyth. I don't want any trouble from Maybe you. Maybe you never heard what Muhammad Khan does to his prisoners, Mr. McGregor. I'm going to go in native costume. I'll get by all right. But I'm going. Oh, very well. <clears throat> when do we start? What, what do you mean, we? Well, you're my prisoner, you know. Can't let you out of my sight. We'll go after the kid. Oh, so I'm Mother McCree, huh? Well, I guess this makes you something, too. Come along, Mrs. Forsyth. Come along. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. just finished the second act of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. During this brief intermission, we bring you our guest of the evening. But first, a word to the ladies. Look at your hands for a moment. Right now, while I'm talking, won't you? Are they as smooth and pretty as you'd like them to be? If they're not, maybe it's the fault of the soap you use for your dishes. Why not switch to Lux Flakes? Lux is kind to your hands, you know. It has no harmful alkali, absolutely nothing to dry and age your skin. 
It helps your hands stay soft and smooth the way you want them to look. Next time you buy soap for your dishes, think of your hands and say, Lux Flakes, please, in the large size box. And now, here's Mr. DeMille with our guest. Like the men of our play, tonight's guest, General Hugh Samuel Johnson, has had a career long characterized by service to his country. Serving with the Army in the Philippines and in Mexico under General Pershing, General Johnson, during the World War, handled the gigantic problems of the drafts and army supply and commanded the 8th Division. Famous as administrator of the NRA, he's also an author of books and articles on national events and a two-fisted columnist for the Scripps Howard newspapers. We switch our microphones now to Washington, D.C. General Johnson, come in. I like these radio presentations of great dramas. I think The Lives of a Bengal Lancer is the best movie I have seen. I saw it four times. My son, a captain in our regular army, has seen it oftener. Most of our soldiers saw it. I never heard any who did not feel about it as I do. My brother-in-law served for years in the Indian Army. He took into France a Punjabi brigade, the very type of troops here pictured. The Lives of a Bengal Lancer is true to life, if not to any particular story. To anybody who has served in the Orient, it wakes memories as poignant as is peat smoke to an Irishman. The motto of West Point is engraved on the ring of every man who ever graduated. Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Pershing, and thousands of others. It is simply duty, honor, country. On that motto, a tradition arose. It demands and receives any sacrifice for the nation, even certain death. We can ever rely on it, as the country has relied for almost a century and a half. The Lives of a Bengal Lancer tells a similar story of the British Army. It is no better and no worse than thousands of stories that the American Army knows. I don't usually cry at movies, but I bathe this one in weeping. It is a simple, honest tale of men who would rather be dead than not be decent. Nobody deserves credit for doing his plain duty, but every man who dies doing it deserves at least the tribute of a tear. The general salutes the soldier. Thank you, General Johnson. We return to Hollywood for Act Three of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. In a fortified valley, nestled among the forbidding Afghan mountains, lies Mogala, stronghold of Mohammed Khan. In a crude room, richly hung with fine tapestries, the Khan, in native dress, is seated cross-legged on the floor. He smiles as he's told of the capture of two British officers. And one of them played most atrociously upon a Pashto reed pipe. When we arrested them as impostors, he dropped the pretense of being deaf and dumb and claimed he played the pure music of Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> These English, what bravery to cross our mountains in such a fashion, disguised as our own people. I believe I shall have dinner in the great hall tonight, Hassan, and I will have these two English officers as my guest with Mr. Stone. I want the dinner to be faultless, in the English manner I taught you. Candles, the good silver, the fine china, and yes, the 1870 brandy and the 1912 Medoc. It is done, Mohammed Khan. I've seen some excellent cricket in my day, Mr. Forsyth. I was asked for 1910, you know. Oh, really? Ah, then that explains your tastes. A really splendid dinner, Khan Saab. The mutton, how was it? Ah, uh, uh, well, now you make my position very difficult. <laughs> Pride of country, you know. <laughs> English mutton is acknowledged the finest. <laughs> More brandy, Mr. Stone? No, thank you. Oh, but you've scarcely eaten a thing. Come, Mr. Stone, a soldier should never refuse to eat. Drink or make love. My sentiments exactly, Khan Saab. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow... For tomorrow we die. Khan Saab, I'm getting fed up with this cat and mouse stuff. What's the score? Easy, Mac. You've caught us. Now what are you going to do with us? <laughs> Mr. McGregor wants action. Well, perhaps you shall have it. 
It will depend. Go on. I naturally regret that Colonel Stone did not rise to my bait and attack me when I uh, uh, removed his son. I now must admit I had underestimated the Colonel's intelligence. Well, what's that make us? It makes of you whatever you choose. In fact, I'm prepared to furnish all three of you with horses and a safe conduct pass through the mountain tribes so you may rejoin your regiment. And what's the catch? You have but to answer two simple questions. Watch this one, Mac. <laughs> I want to know by what route the yearly ammunition train is coming to supply the 41st Lancers and just where the 41st Lancers plans to meet it. Hmm. Well, when the furry household animal jumped out of the bag, it really jumped, didn't it? <laughs> well, gentlemen, you will not tell me. We have ways to make men talk, as you are all no doubt thinking. Effective ways. And so, if you will not give the information voluntarily, I will have to call upon experts to assist you. My household guards, gentlemen. Does this mean we're prisoners, not guests? I regret to say it does. Well, that's splendid. Because I've been wanting to tell you all along what I really thought of that mutton. And precisely my thought, Mr. McGregor. Uh, I regret to say it, Mohammed Khan, but your mutton is distinctly inferior. The word, Mr. Forsyth, is rotten. Gentlemen, as you may have guessed, is the, uh, the room where we obtain much of our most desirable information. Good God. Steady, pull yourself together, Stan. Oh, really, sirs, must I proceed to such unpleasant and absurd extremes as torture? Well, now these, these are the beginning. They look like mere strips of thin bamboo. However, driven under the nails and lighted, we find them very, uh, warm. <laughs> And persuasive. Like the Jalau. Mr. Forsyth and Mr. Stone, I will ask you two to watch while we start with Mr. McGregor. Salutary, the effect of watching at times. You devil, shut up. Thank you, Mr. Forsyth. I dislike dramatics intensely myself. Now, Mr. McGregor, if you will sit down, please. Like the Jalau. Warm, Mr. McGregor? Now, that ammunition train will be where, please? I don't know. Where? I don't know. Oh, but you do. Think hard. I don't know. I don't know. That you, Forsyth? Yes. Have a cigarette. They all through with you? I hope so. <laughs> Seem to have got to the second stage with Stone. <laughs> I thought they'd busted the whip on me. You know, now I've been through it. A licking my old man gave me once was almost as bad. Oh, told me. You didn't talk, did you? Not unless I was unconscious. Did I? Never knew you could swear like you did. Oh. Oh, I'm not so bad. <laughs> Keeping him longer in there than they kept us. Yeah, seems like it. Hope he's had a licking from his old man. Well, not him. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, well, that's a new experience for him. <coughs> you know, somehow it, it hurts worse to hear it on him. Maybe that's because you think he'll talk. Well, don't you? I can't help but feel... Well, after all, he's got the old man's blood in him. They're bringing him in. Hope so. Oh, my God, my God. Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Here, here, take his head back. On the bed with him. Right, up. Here, here cigarette, kid. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Listen, did you talk? Leave me alone. Sorry, Stone. We have to know. I didn't talk to you. I swear I didn't. All right, kid. All right, we believe you. Here, here, take the cigarette. Well, I guess Mohammed Khan found the Lancers a pretty tough bunch. Say, uh, maybe one of you fellas can tell me, when do whiskers stop itching and get to be a beard? Now, that is really a problem for the philosophers, Mr. McGregor. Now, take my own beard. 
I would say that in another week I shall be um, about eligible for the French Academy. Oh, don't you fellows ever talk like human beings? When you're in jail, Mr. Stone, you cease to be a human being. Oh, listen. Listen, what's that noise? Take a look from the window. Right. It's another caravan, probably. Well, what's the matter? Stone. What? Didn't you tell us that they didn't make you talk? I told you I didn't talk. I gave you my word, didn't I? What'd you see out there? It's another caravan, all right. They're loaded with ammunition boxes. Hundreds of them. And all bearing our seal. Our ammunition? Two million rounds. Captured by Mohammed Khan that returns back against British soldiers. You hear that, Stone? That's what you've done. Oh, don't, don't. I couldn't help it. I no couldn't. No wonder they didn't take us back into their torture chamber. They didn't have to. Because you told them. Because you didn't have the nerve to stand a little pain. <laughs> Well, you'll think of the pain you'll cause our men, our messmates. Oh, stop it. One of us gone to pieces is enough. <laughs> Don't take it too hard, Stone. It's not your fault entirely. But I can see now how right your father was. The Lancers are soldiers, well-seasoned soldiers, toughened by service. You're a kid and the Lancers are men. Your father wanted to make a man of you. Wanted to get you so that you could take it. Take anything and never let the army down. That's the only thing we want out here. Chance to do a job and to do it well. Well, I guess you know that now, kid. Watch it. Good evening, gentlemen. Well, well, <laughs> the old mutton server. My friends, I thought you might be interested to know your clever Colonel Stone is about to pay me a visit. Some call it an attack against me with the 41st Bengal Lancers. They are now only two hours away. I expect to make his reception a memorable one but I hope to capture the Colonel alive so that I may see his face when I present him with his son, who has betrayed him. Good evening, my friends. 300 lances against that ammunition. Oh, the Colonel wouldn't do anything so foolish. He has to. Once that ammunition's distributed, it means a general war. He's got to try to recapture it or destroy that ammunition. Wait. Well, I've got an idea. I think so. What do you see out there, Mac? I was just measuring the distance from here to the place where they're storing that stuff. Oh, about, uh, about 200 yards, I'd say. No, 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 near 100. Yeah, I ran the 200 at Cambridge. Is that so? Well, I run the 110 flat at McGill. This is a job for 100 yards. Toss you for it, Mac. Oh, no, you don't. I'm your superior officer. You take your orders from well, me. Don't forget, you're my prisoner. You take orders from me. No. Shh, someone's coming. That's the guard, with our food. Now. Here's our chance. Get behind the door. Get it, Get it. Oh, well, so long, Mac. Oh, no, you don't. If anyone's going. I'm sorry, Forsyth, but I said this was my job. So long. Mac, Mac, come back. Shut up. You want to give him away? What's he going to do? He's going to blow up that ammunition shed, if he can. Blow up the... Mac! Get away from that door. Oh, no, no, I'm going after you him. You try it and you'll get what Mac gave me. Oh, but he's going to die for what I did. Let me out. Let me out. You, oh. you asked for it, Stone. Now, listen. McGregor went out there to blow up that ammunition and himself with it so that your father can hold up his head. You might think you can run out on that, but you can't. You're going to face it. All your life you'll face it. And your father's never going to know. And that's the debt you owe McGregor. You hear? I hear. I hear. Yes, then you pray that Mac has luck in blowing that place up or you'll have no father to keep the secret from. Go on, pray. Pray, I tell you. Oh, God. God let him get away. It's a miracle I'm asking now. But he's there to die for me. For what I've done. It's I who should die. There he goes. Him. There he goes. It's a miracle. Across the yard. It's a miracle oh, I'm keep going, Mac. Keep going, men. Go on. God. He's there. He's there. Good boy, Mac. Good boy. And by the command of His Majesty the King Emperor, and in the presence of this regiment, I confer upon you, Lieutenant Forsyth, the Distinguished Service Order. Thank you, sir. Second Lieutenant Donald Stone, 41st Bengal Lancers for conspicuous gallantry in action. During the recent siege of Angala, he broke from the cell in which he was imprisoned and attacked the enemy from within, killing their leader, Mohammed Khan. 
and thus demoralizing hostile forces when the success of our arms is in the balance. Lieutenant Donald Stone, by command of His Majesty the King Emperor, and in the sight of this regiment, I confer upon you the Distinguished Service Order. My boy. Thank you, sir. Captain Alan McGregor, 41st Bengal Lancers, deceased. At the sacrifice of his life, he destroyed enemy ammunition supplies, contributing thereby to the success of our arms in action before the siege of Mogala. His Majesty the King Emperor has been most graciously pleased to confer posthumously the Victoria Cross upon the late Captain Alan McGregor. In accordance with the custom of this regiment, I place this cross upon the saddle cloth of his horse. Move to the right in column of force. Home force. Right turn. And the left. Quick march. McGregor. McGregor. Yes, to take it. To take anything. To never let the army down. That's the only thing we want out here. It's a chance to do a job. And to do it well. Well, I guess you know that now, kid. Falls on the last act of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. In a moment, our stars return for their bow. But first, I wonder if you can guess how many teaspoons of flakes one large sized box of Lux holds. I'll wager you won't come anywhere near the right figure. Well, measured out spoonful for spoonful, there are nearly 400 rounded teaspoons of flakes in one large sized box. Nearly 400 teaspoonfuls. Think of that. And just a few flakes make such wonderful suds. Gentle but effective. One box of Lux will do many, many things for you. And that's a good thing to remember while you're thinking of spring house cleaning. It would take a long time to list all the things Lux flakes will keep fresh and bright in every room of your house. But just to give you an idea, in the bedroom... The blankets and bedspreads, pillows and slip covers. In the living room. Rugs and upholstery, lampshades, piano keys, curtains. The kitchen. Glassware and dishes, of course. The refrigerator, furniture, and linoleum. And the woodwork all over the house. Why, if you don't know how much Lux Flakes can do for you, you'll want to get acquainted with them now. You'll be amazed how much easier Lux makes your housework and how inexpensive it is. A little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. So get the generous large size box tomorrow. And use it for everything safe in water alone. And remember, while you work with gentle Lux Flakes, you'll be saving your hands. And that's mighty important to any woman. Mr. DeMille. In Messrs. Flynn, Ahern, Cooper, and Smith, we have respectively a famous sailor, an airplane pilot, a trap drummer, and a cricket player, which leaves the field open for any topic that may pop into their distinguished heads. Uh, by right of seniority, Mr. Smith, you take the lead. Very well, then. I'll begin by suggesting that Brian and Errol report a little more consistently for cricket practice. Do they play that sissy game? Sissy game? Young man, just you come round to Griffith Park some Sunday afternoon and observe. You'll be playing a different tune on that drum of yours. Sissy game? Got any ducats? <laughs> you don't need tickets, Jackie. Few people seem to know it, but... They can witness a fine exhibition of cricket and some of Hollywood's greatest stars playing it for no charge at all by just coming around to the public park. And incidentally, enjoying a nice cup of tea on the house. Perhaps that's it, Brian. Maybe you and Errol don't like the brand of tea we've been serving after the game. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Smith. Rough games like cricket are all right for you youngsters, but we're getting on, you know. <laughs> all the playing Errol and I have been doing lately has been on the sound stages. But what about that trip you just made to Dodge City, Kansas, Mr. Flynn, for your new picture? Ah, uh, yes, Errol. I hear you had a wonderful time there. Hope I get a trip to Mexico for the premiere of Juarez. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Wait till you hear the rootin', tootin', and shootin' when Mr. DeMille opens Union Pacific in Omaha a couple of weeks from now. Mm, kind words, Arrow. But you gave us something to shoot at in your Kansas expedition. Well, sir, I can honestly say I was never so impressed in all my life. Actors, newspapers, photographers, all of us traveled to Dodge City. That's a town of about 10,000 people, but when we got there, we found an additional 90,000 visitors. Well, I've been in this country over four years now, but I never really saw America until that trip. I mean the real America, the people who go to see the pictures we make. I've never seen such hospitality or real down-to-earth courtesy as we saw on that trip. And here's one very important discovery for me. After making it, a broadcast like this has taken on an entirely new meaning. I used to just talk into this little black microphone here and hope for the best, but now I feel that I know the people we're playing to. And knowing them, I can't help feeling that I know the finest people in the world. Good night. And so say all of us. Good night. And thank you, C.B. Uh, Good night. Good night, night. Mr. DeMille. Good night, Lancer. Report here for duty soon again. Don't miss the news that Mr. DeMille brings you shortly about the stars and play coming next Monday. Tonight's cast included Ian McLaren as Major Hamilton, C. Montague Shaw as Sir Thomas Woodley, Nancy Leach as Tanya, Lal Shan Mera as Vizier, Eric Snowden as Captain Hendrickson, and Ian Purvis as Mr. Dawson. Errol Flynn appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers. Brian Hearn's new Warner picture is Warras. C. Aubrey Smith is seen in the RKO film Five Came Back, and Douglas Dumbrill in Captain Fury. Lewis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio, where he's directing music for The Return of the Cisco Kid. Be sure to listen to the new Lux Daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, the story of a young and attractive woman doctor struggling to make life worthwhile for herself and her two small children. You can hear it over most of these stations in the United States every afternoon, Monday through Friday, at 2.15 Eastern Time, 1.15 Central Time, 3.15 3.15 Mountain Time, and 2.15 Pacific Time. This new daytime program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Now, Mr. DeMille. Tonight's play was concerned with a type of warfare that's found only in one corner of the earth. But there's another battle which concerns all of us, the war against rackets. Seldom has this modern crusade been pictured more effectively than in the hit film, Bullets or Ballots, the exciting melodrama you'll hear a week from tonight. The story of a city detective's fight against organized crime. The star will be the same powerful performer you saw in the picture, Edward G. Robinson. And opposite Mr. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater presentation of Lives of a Bengal Lancer has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the gentle, thrifty flakes known to women the world over. As Mr. DeMille told you, our play next Monday night is Bullets or Ballots, and starred in it, you will hear Edward G. Robinson, Mary Oster, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Join us again next week in the Lux Radio Theater. Be part of the large audience that gathers each Monday to enjoy an hour of dramatic entertainment and to meet Hollywood and its famous people. The announcer has been Melville Ruick, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System.